Hello everybody, it's another episode of the Drug Book Podcast. Uh, Today we're going to talk about some specific drugs, mainly morphine, heroin, and fentanyl. And we're going to discuss the so-called opioid epidemic. Now I do have a little bit of a cold, so I may sound a little weird today. I'm going to try to edit all the sniffling out, but uh, just because of the nature of my job, I try to get as many of these podcasts done as possible. It's as soon as possible, so that's why I'm going to record today, even though I have a little bit of a cold going on. In this episode, I'm going to explain exactly how these drugs cause the effects they do. Um, Just like I say in the book, this isn't meant to be a textbook or uh, something pharmacologists should read. It's more for people who aren't experts, just to explain the basic mechanisms of these drugs and why they cause the effects they do and why they can be lethal. And then we're going to talk about um, how... Prohibition has made them more dangerous. I know we covered that a little bit in the first episode, but we're going to talk specifically about these three drugs and why they're similar and why they're not, and then what Prohibition does to make them more dangerous and what models we can base legalizing these drugs off of that have shown to be safer and more effective for giving people opioids in a safe way. And one of the main goals of this episode is to really show that Opioids are not the boogeyman that people make them out to be and that the idea of an opioid epidemic is really just a prohibition epidemic and it has ultimately nothing to do with these particular drugs. And the reason I'm only mentioning these three in my book, I go over morphine, oxycodone, hydrocodone, fentanyl, mitrogenine, heroin. I go over a few different opioids in the book, but I want to keep the podcast a little more simple and shorter than the chapters of the book. And these three drugs are really the most important to talk about when we're talking about opioids. So if you want to engage with me directly, just follow me on Twitter at the Drug Book MP and we can get the episode started. All three of these drugs belong to a class of substances called opioids. Um, Morphine and heroin are both opiates, meaning they are derived or taken out of the opium poppy, uh, which is Popaver somniferum. They contain a few different opioids, and the way that these opioids are extracted from the plant is from the sap of the seed pods. So people will take a razor and make small incisions on the seed pods, and the wax will come out, and it'll contain codeine, morphine and paramorphine also known as the bane so when we're talking about drugs like oxycodone hydrocodone and heroin those three drugs are all derivatives of morphine they're all made from morphine which is extracted from the opium poppy so all these drugs are really the same thing and if we look at the morphine molecule and compare it to the heroin molecule you'll see that they are very similar the only difference is the two acetyl bonds on the top left and bottom left of the molecule with the orientation I'm showing on the screen. Those are the only differences between heroin and morphine. And these acetyl bonds don't really do much besides increase the affinity to the receptors and that will make the drug more potent. Now the receptors that these drugs have affinity with, the main one is the mu opioid receptor. When this receptor is agonized, it causes a release of dopamine, a small release of serotonin, and it mimics the release of endorphin. Dopamine release is the key ingredient to the experience that opioids cause. But to figure out why the dopamine release of this drug is going to be different from the dopamine release of something like methamphetamine, it really relies on the uh, neurotransmitters that these drugs are already working with. So endorphin is an endogenous opioid, and this is something that I'm going to bring up again and again as I go through the pharmacology chapters, it's that the drug ultimately isn't what's causing the effects when someone ingests them. It's what it's tricking the brain into doing. The brain can already do these things or the drugs would have no effect. So when you ingest an opioid, you are decreasing the amount of endogenous opioids, but the drug is mimicking their effects while also increasing dopamine. And since these drugs mimic the effect of endorphin, that is where the sedation, the relaxation, and the pain relief that is usually associated with opioid use comes from. And when dopamine is released, you're gonna increase pleasure, it's gonna boost your mood, uh, 
and you're going to have an increase of motivation, typically. Now, once people start abusing these drugs, the effects they cause from mimicking endorphin will overcome the motivation aspect of dopamine release, because that is where the people begin falling asleep and getting the nods that's also associated with opioid abuse. And that is just due to the fact that when more endorphin is in the brain, the person is more sedated. So when you have a drug that mimics the effects of endorphin and the concentrations of it in the brain increase, they will become more sedated. And when we're talking about morphine, that drug has been used for at least a thousand years. Um, ancient Egyptians were known to grow lots of Papaver somniferum, and they were very big into plant drugs. They were using a lot of morphine back in the day. And it is a drug that's really changed the world in a lot of ways because it gave us a very effective treatment for pain where drugs like NSAIDs they weren't as if they're definitely not as effective as opioids for treating pain now there's some sort of pain that NSAIDs can treat better like inflammatory pain in particular but when you're talking about severe pain from severe injuries like back injuries and neck injuries broken limbs opioids are really the gold standard for pain treatment over uh, a course of a long time but of course we People weren't using like pure powdered morphine or IV injection morphine back then. And even that wasn't very common up until the last century or so. Even during World War I, many of the soldiers were self-treating their PTSD by smoking opium, which is the hardened wax. Or it's really more gooey. It's not necessarily hard like a rock or anything. It's like a gooey, waxy substance that's extracted from the seed pod and you ball it up to like the size of a match head and you put it in a pipe or on the end of a cigarette and you smoke it and you get the effects of the opioids and the drug. People have used this drug forever ever since it was discovered because it's enjoyable and it is effective for many different ailments that people would face. Morphine itself was first discovered as the intoxicant in the, in the waxy substance from the seed pods in 1806 by a 21 year old assistant researcher named Friedrich Wilhelm Adam Saturner. I probably butchered his name. But he ran experience, uh, experiments with the opium that had the morphine removed and noticed it gave animals basically no effect. He then tested animals with the isolated morphine and realized it had 10 times the potency of unprocessed opium. He published a study in 1812 about morphine bringing pain relief to a young female who had suffered an injury. And morphine was only extracted out of the plant until about 1852 when Marshall D. Gates Jr. synthesized the molecule. And I know I talked about this a little bit in the first episode, um, but it'll come up more and more as we talk about the pharmacology of drugs, particularly plant drugs. And it's that synthetic material is always preferable over plant-based material because the amount of substance, like the amount of morphine in the opium poppy sap can vary greatly and that makes it impossible to accurate to accurately dose and that can lead to some dangerous situations for people who aren't familiar with dosing opium wax so there's this weird dichotomy in the world of drugs where people think that plant-based drugs are safer or more something than synthetic drugs and that's just not true Syn- synthetic drugs synthetically created material is always going to be more pure which makes it easier to dose which makes it safer now of course this is assuming the synthetic material was made properly as we talked about in the first episode uh, bad chemists can really cause drugs to be really dangerous like we talked about the crocodile situation where they were leaving phosphorus in the final product and people were injecting phosphorus into their veins and causing their limbs to rot So the drugs have to be made properly, but if you have a professional chemist making your drug, you would always prefer that over ingesting the drug through natural um, methods. Now with any opioid, there are expected side effects, especially with people who are using them for the first time, and mainly they are nausea, dizziness, and constipation. Um, Some people do sweat a lot more with opioids. Whenever I first started using them, that was definitely something I noticed, and Uh, During this whole book, I I bring up side effects for a reason, and it's because I want people who are using drugs to realize that these things are normal, and it's not something to panic over, because there have been times in my life, and I know many people who also use drugs that were encountering very common side effects, like with cannabis, anxiety and increased heart rate and sweating is very common, but when you're high, you can overthink this shit and start to panic and think you're going to die or need to go to the hospital, and 
that is almost never really the case, especially with cannabis. And even with opioids, the, the death rate for people who use opioids is very low. And we'll talk about that later on. But side effects you can expect from ingesting any opioid, and this includes opium poppy wax, is like nausea. You may throw up. Um, your stomach may hurt a little bit because the what this drug does is it kind of slows down your GI tract, which is what causes the constipation. And as it's being slowed down due to the drug entering your system, it can cause a, a kind of vague stomach pain. And that's definitely something I encountered when I first started using these drugs. And the constipation never really seems to go away um, until you quit using the drug. But the nausea and dizziness and sweating and things like that, they all tend to fade as the tolerance grows and you get and your body gets more used to processing these drugs. Now, smoking opium is actually pretty interesting. It, it's something I've never done, but I've talked to a couple people who have, and I've read some reports online, and all of them said that it is surprisingly smooth. It tastes like floral, like lavender almost, and it didn't make them cough. They barely even noticed they were inhaling something until the effects kicked in. So it's a little bit different than something like cannabis or tobacco where coughing is sort of the norm. Like it's almost like a, a rite of passage into cannabis smoking to cough so much you kind of tear up or can't breathe for a little bit because you've coughed so badly. But that doesn't seem to be the case with uh, smoking opium. Now when morphine enters the brain, as I said earlier, it will agonize the mu opioid receptor or the MOR. There are other opioid receptors that it has slight affinity with, like the kappa and delta opioid receptor, but those seem to have very minimal effect on the experience that most people report having with classical opioids like morphine, heroin, and fentanyl. And agonization of, opio of, of receptors means that it is activating the receptor. So the molecule will bind to a site on the receptor and it will cause it to carry out its natural function, which in this case is releasing dopamine. It is also hypothesized that the effects of opioids are not solely caused by dopamine release. However, dopamine release is certainly the main cause for the pleasurable effects. The release of dopamine is also caused by endorphin itself. As I said earlier, endorphin is an endogenous opioid, meaning it is in our body already, and we can do certain things in life to cause endorphin concentrations to increase, which will mimic the effects of something like morphine. The difference is, with a drug, you're able to access these effects at will. You don't have to go exercise. You don't have to go have sex. You don't have to finish completing a puzzle. And there's a, all of those things will release endorphin and dopamine, which will mimic that sort of effect, but for not as long and probably not as intensely, depending on the activity, of course. I'm sure most people would say, who aren't addicts, of course, would say that something like having sex is going to be more pleasurable than taking some morphine. But people enjoy different things. You never know. Um, me, for example, whenever, before I hurt my back and I was always kind of doing something, whether it was running or boxing or playing basketball, um, exercise often felt better than opioids, um, just generally. And that, and that high lasts for hours. And that is because you're releasing these endogenous drugs in your brain like dopamine and endorphin and serotonin and you're causing these pleasurable effects to happen in a natural way. So again this is just to show that the drugs aren't really causing these effects. It's stuff our body can already do. It's just that the drug is kind of a shortcut to accessing this state of consciousness. And with morphine all of this activity in the brain starts at about 10 milligrams when taken orally. Anything lower than that, the effects are either non-existent or so mild that the user hardly notices them. 10 milligrams is a low, low oral dose by most standards. If you happen to be prescribed morphine pills, which is very unlikely, but if that does happen, your dose would likely be in the like 10 to 25 milligram range. It would mostly, most likely not go over 100 milligrams a day. The onset of morphine when taken orally is between 20 and 40 minutes, uh, depending on when the patient last ate, what they ate, etc., uh, with peak effects occurring from one to one and a half hours after ingestion. Most of the time, if someone is put on morphine, it's in the hospital after a painful surgery or bad injury. Uh, they'll be getting IV, and the dosages work much differently with uh, IV ingestion with all drugs. So... With IV, your threshold dose for effects is going to be around half a milligram. And the user is put in a hospital bed. They'll be getting morphine on a drip. That puts about two and a half to five milligrams out every four hours. And the reason that you see IV 
dose dose is so much lower is because it increases the bioavailability of the drug and it gets to the brain much quicker. And bioavailability is basically meaning how much is still available to the brain after it goes through metabolic processes. So when you eat a drug, you're going to see a bioavailability drop pretty dramatically most of the time because your liver is going to destroy some of the drug. It's going to metabolize it into inactive things. And then you're only going to be taking like 60% of what you actually swallowed in terms of the mass of the drug. When you're doing IV or smoking or snorting, you don't really see those issues because those routes of administration typically tend to put the drug straight into your blood and the blood will carry it to your brain. So for example, when taken orally, the bioavailability of morphine is around 20 to 40%. And the reason there's a range here is due to different bases of the drug, meaning the composition of the tablet can change the bioavailability. There's morphine hydrochloride, morphine sulfate, etc. Another reason is the bioavailability of morphine actually increases in chronic opioid users. And this is the case with all opioids. Most people who want to use morphine will come across it in the form of opium, unless they're in the hospital. And the best way to use opium for efficiency is just to smoke the waxy, tarry substance. Uh, people do make tea with opium and uh, papaver somniferum seeds. I have made tea with the seeds. It tastes terrible. The experience was pleasant, but overall underwhelming. Uh, the seeds are very small, and to make a powerful tea, that will cause strong effects. Hundreds, if not thousands of seeds will be needed. And this can be dangerous because concentrations in the seeds can range from anywhere from 3.6 to 261 milligrams of morphine per kilogram of seeds. So when using plant-based drugs, it's always just important to keep in mind that the variability can, impurity can cause a dangerous situation if you're not careful. Now there are drugs that you do not want to mix with any opioids, and I'll, I'll talk about this more also in the heroin and fentanyl part of this podcast, but drugs like other depressants like alcohol, Xanax, GHB, you don't want to mix those with morphine because it will um, increase the risk of respiratory depression and death, and that is usually the mechanism for um, death by overdose with opioids. It decreases how effectively your body is able to get oxygen flow throughout all the organs and everything and so your body will eventually stop breathing and people who are overdosing on opioids it's pretty common to hear them really struggling to breathe uh, they're kind of wheezing or they sound like they're choking and this is just because uh, basically the respiratory um, system becomes so relaxed that they're not able to breathe as effectively and they're not able to get oxygen through their blood as effectively and then, of course, if you administer Narcan to someone who's going through this, they will likely recover because it will block the effects of morphine or heroin or fentanyl, and they'll be able to wake up. Um, but when you administer Narcan, uh, what you're doing is sending the person directly into withdrawal because what morphine and heroin and fentanyl do is they agonize the mu opioid receptor, and Narcan blocks that receptor. Now, one of the issues with Narcan is one, that it sends people straight into withdrawal, but two, the half-life of Narcan is not as long as some of the opioids that people use, like heroin. So the Narcan will leave the body before the heroin will, and there have been many cases of people repeatedly overdosing after being administered Narcan because they're trying to stop the withdrawal, and then they'll get the dose that they just took to quit the withdrawal, but they'll also get what was left on the receptor or in the bloodstream before the Narcan was administered. And this has led to people overdosing three or four times in a night um, after being administered Narcan three or four times. So that is a common issue. It's also dangerous, but not as dangerous uh, to mix um, amphetamines and cocaine and things like that with opioids. It can still um, like put stress on your heart and it's not perfectly safe, but it's not near as dangerous as mixing opioids with depressants. Now, another dangerous thing to mix are antihistamines with opioids. Um, not many people are aware of this, but mixing those two drugs will also, um, it can greatly increase the risk of respiratory depression and death when you co-administer those drugs. So something I say throughout the whole book, and I will say throughout the whole podcast, is that in my opinion, it is usually best to just take drugs alone. Um, mixing drugs is typically just generally not a great idea to me. Um, there are some drug combinations I have enjoyed very much, like um, ketamine and cannabis and uh, oxycodone and cannabis or mitrogenine and cannabis. Those combinations are enjoyable and pose very little risk to the user. 
But for the most part, mixing drugs is a bad idea, in my opinion. So now we'll talk about the lethal dose of fentanyl. No, I mean, of morphine, I'm sorry. Uh, this is something that really drives me crazy when I'm looking at, like, reading articles about opioids like fentanyl and heroin, and it's that people writing these stories tend to pretend that there is one lethal dose. Like, if you go over this much uh, heroin or morphine that you're going to die every time you do it, no matter what. And I've seen that sort of rhetoric many times. And in the second episode, I kind of showed a Fox News article that was treating fentanyl in that way. And the way that you measure lethal doses is through the LD50, which is the lethal dose for 50% of test subjects. So this is essentially an average lethal dose. And when, it, when morphine is orally ingested, ingested, particularly morphine sulfate in this study, it, the LD50 is 461 milligrams per kilogram of body weight in rats. So this means for every kilogram that a rat weighs, which probably isn't many, you have to give 461 milligrams of morphine for that to be an average lethal dose for rats. Now, this cannot be directly converted into human weight, meaning one can't just take 461 milligrams and multiply it by their body weight in kilograms to get an estimated lethal dose. To convert a rat dose into an accurate measurement for humans, we would need to divide the dose by 6.2 or multiply it by 0.162. This changes with the animal. Uh, we must do this to account for the difference in surface area of our bodies and different metabolic different metabolic rates. Larger animals have slower metabolic processes. After the human conversion is completed, the LD50 for orally ingested morphine sulfate is 74.68 milligrams per kilogram. For an average 150 pound human, which is roughly 68 kilograms, for that person to reach an average lethal dose, they would need to take 5,078 milligrams or 5 grams of morphine. Now, this is something that is going to become abundantly clear as we move on through the book and podcast talking about specific drugs, and it's that the lethal dose for when these drugs are taken alone is almost always absurd. No one is taking 5 grams of morphine, ever, which is really why you don't see many deaths with morphine. That and heroin is on the street, so people are using more heroin than morphine. But even when we get to the heroin part of this podcast, you'll see that the LD50 for heroin is pretty astronomical compared to what people are taking. And that, and that kind of shows why we only have 14,000 deaths for heroin or so a year. And it's because not many people are that irresponsible to take that much of a drug. So it should be obvious that if a user sticks to responsible doses, like medical doses are a little bit higher, that they're going to be just fine taking morphine as often as they please. If they're taking care of their life and they're responsible adults, then their drug use is likely not going to be problematic either, as we talked about in the last chapter or last episode of this podcast. Just to summarize what's going on with morphine, it's a mu opioid receptor agonist. When that receptor is agonized, there's a release of dopamine and then a small release of serotonin that causes the effects people enjoy while ingesting this drug. The LD50 for a 150-pound person is around 5 grams, which is a crazy dose because most medical doses are 25 to 50 milligrams at a time if they're taken orally and 10 to 15 milligrams when taken IV. Now, it is important, and we'll see this in the when I'm about to move on to heroin, that just like when the dose is lower, like threshold dose is lower for IV administration, the LD50 will also lower as well. So if I give an IV LD50, it's going to be lower than oral, but that doesn't mean that the drug is more dangerous. It just means that the route of administration is different. It is safe to say that heroin is typically about twice as potent as morphine. And that's why when you see these articles about fentanyl, it's saying it's 100 times as potent as morphine, 50 times as potent as heroin. And that is true. Fentanyl is an extremely potent drug, and we will talk about that drug in just a second. And then we're going to compare all three. Now, heroin has a pretty bad reputation. Opioids in general do. And it, it is like inviting people to harass and insult you to advocate for opioid legalization and there's some people like Hamilton Morris who are on board with drug legalization and do whole documentaries about drugs on Hulu, and he didn't even have 
an episode about opioids besides Kratom because he just didn't want to deal with the bullshit that comes along with talking about this. The bullshit is formed by ignorant people who watch shows like Painkiller and form their entire opinion on the drugs based off of that. And then there's also just a lot of blatant hypocrisy with it. And there's a question I've never had answered to me on these, uh, especially on Twitter with these people uh, talking about the opioid epidemic and crisis and all this. And my question is like, what are the parameters for a drug epidemic? Like opioids kill about 80,000 people a year, roughly. Alcohol kills 140,000 people a year. Tobacco kills almost half a million people a year. So I, I don't know what the parameters are to call something a drug crisis. Because we're not talking about an alcohol or tobacco crisis. We're talking about an opioid crisis when it, they kill less people than both of the drugs that people use legally every day. So this idea of an opioid epidemic is kind of just like the war on drugs redefined. It's just an agenda-based fear-mongering tool that people use to, that politicians use to kind of score easy wins with their supporters. They're like, we're going to be hard on opioids and people cheer because they think we're in the middle of a inanimate object epidemic, and which is just fucking foolish to say the least. And it's something that has been circulating for a while and people talk all this shit about the prescribed opioid thing and how it's saying, like I've heard many people say, people go from prescribed opioids to heroin and that's not really true. Like I showed in the first episode, only about 4% of people prescribed opioids move on to heroin or street opioids. And the most important thing for this topic in terms of ending prohibition is that less than 1% of people prescribed opioids die from them. And most of the time, those people were co-administering them with alcohol or Xanax or something like that. So this prescription opioid model is actually a perfect example of how legalization should be ran. It should uh, Pharmacists should be selling it to people. They should be there to answer questions. And there should be recommended dosages on the bottle like you get whenever you pick up a hydrocodone prescription. It says take 10 milligrams two to three times a day or whatever your prescription is. And we have seen that when that model is implemented, less people die in terms of the total percentage of people using them. You also see, and not even that, not even the total percentage of people, just less people die, period. Even though hundreds of millions of people were prescribed opioids over the past five years, only like... 14,000 of them were dying per year to it. And so that that's less than 1% of total people prescribed those drugs are dying from it. And it's because the product is clean. It's coming from a regulated environment made by professional chemists. That is a perfect model of how it should be ran. And it's perfect evidence for how legalization would save lives in terms of opioid use. And then there's the other thing I mentioned in episode one, where as the prescription opioid frequency went down, opioid deaths went up. Now, obviously, there is more at play than just that, but I don't think that's a coincidence at all. So when we move on to heroin, it's important to keep that in mind, because what will become very apparent as I'm talking about heroin is that it's the same thing as morphine. Your brain cannot tell the difference between these two drugs. It's just attaching to the mu opioid receptor, it is agonizing it, and it is causing the release of dopamine and serotonin, the same exact way morphine does. There is no way, there's no mechanism for heroin to be more addictive than morphine. There's no mechanism for it to be more dangerous than morphine. Now, it is more potent, but it's simple. Take less heroin than you would morphine. It's a it's full stop right there. That's all you need to do to stay as safe with heroin as you do morphine. Now, there are some differences in routes of administration because when, morph- when heroin is ingested orally, the liver turns it into morphine before it reaches the blood and the bioavailability is really low. So most people inject or snort this drug. Injecting is going to add a certain amount of risk to drug use, and it's not something I recommend because it's usually pointless and a waste of the drug. Where you can just snort the drug. I've never really heard stories about morphine being super painful to snort, like like some drugs like DMT is like renownedly painful to snort. But it, if you're not a professional, you shouldn't be injecting yourself with anything. 
Uh, the chances of you splitting a vein or spreading sexually or blood transmitted diseases, it, it increases the more you inject yourself. So just snort the drug. The intensity and the onset is going to be about the same with both of those routes of administration and snorting it is much safer. Now, one thing interesting about heroin is that it was, when it was first created, it was considered a very remarkable, almost miracle drug because it, it was a lot easier to dose than morphine because it was synthetic and it was a lot more pure. And there were studies done in the 1900s, like early 1900s, using 300, 400 people. And the researchers back then already noting what I talked about last episode, where the study says only 8% of the people became addicted to the substance. It's pretty remarkable how that statistic holds true over the 100 years since these studies. Another doctor treated 48 patients that were dealing with various things, uh, like bronchitis, pain, and I'm going to quote his study here. It says, no harmful results, especially as I observed no abstinence symptoms, meaning withdrawal. Generally, it appeared that in all cases in which a period of time was allowed to elapse, the full effect could again be obtained with small doses. It may be concluded that um, regarding tolerance to heroin, certain individuals react peculiarly, and it is recommended that in the case of old and feeble persons, the initial dose should not be over 0 0.005 grams. And I'm not necessarily saying these studies have any sort of like intrinsic value now. I'm just saying that even from 1890 to 1910, people studying this drug knew of its addiction potential and knew of tolerance, and they knew how to use it safely. They also showed the myth of never being able to get the same effect as the first high. It, they showed that it's just a myth, and that is something that's often spread around. It's that people use the drug once, and then they're chasing that high forever. It's like, no, it's just bullshit. Like, you use the drug once, you use it again, it causes the same effects. It may not be as, like, surprising or mind-blowing because you've because you had never experienced it before that moment, but in terms of the enjoyable effects, they, they never really change. It's doing the same thing to your brain, and if you give yourself time to lower your tolerance and take a break every now and then, then you're going to be able to um, recreate those effects when you had no tolerance to the drug. It, it's not like you use a drug and it changes your brain to where you can't feel that effect again. That is just a drug war myth. So there's no reason that we shouldn't know how to use it safely today is basically what I'm saying. If we knew how to do it whenever the drug was first created and we had these people receiving treatment and seeing great results for their bronchitis and pain and things like that and there's no reason that we can't use heroin safely today like i also said in the last episode the medical applicability of drugs shouldn't really be the forefront of anything it just needs to be look this drug is safe if you take it in responsible doses and it is clean and pure it's a safe drug Toxicologically, opioids are some of the safest drugs in the world. They're much safer than NSAIDs, which cause stomach bleeding and ulcers. They're safer than alcohol, which cause liver rot and all sorts of issues in high doses. They're safer than amphetamines, which also cause a bunch of issues when you're taking them in high doses. When you're taking opioids in high doses, as long as you're not taking enough to die, you're the worst you're going to deal with is some chronic constipation. You're not like they're not carcinogens, they're not neurotoxic, they're nothing like that. Now, if you take ridiculously high doses, like I pointed out in the morphine chapter, then yeah, you can die, but you can do that with any drug. That's that shouldn't be surprising. Any drug besides like cannabis and some oddballs here and there. But when you're talking about most drugs people use, like alcohol, you can kill yourself with alcohol. But alcohol is also immensely toxic to the user. And so when you compare that to something like opioids, you see that the toxicity worries with opioids are much lower than drugs people already use. So there, I'd, I've never really heard a reason to keep these drugs illegal, especially when we talk about what happened in episode one and two with all these issues that prohibition causes. So now let's talk about the LD50 of heroin, just so we can spell this out a little more. And as I said earlier, it is twice as potent as morphine. So if you want the effects of taking 20 milligrams of morphine, then you can snort like 5 to 10 milligrams of heroin. And the reason that I said 5 is because the route of administration will be different. And so the effects will be a little more intense and the bioavailability will be higher. So you do have to consider these things when you're talking about potency. It's just that people don't take heroin orally because of what I said earlier. It just turns into morphine. But when you snort it, you're going to have higher bioavailability. So the dose will still need to be a little bit lower, but it doesn't need to be 
remarkable. Like it, it doesn't have to be such a low dose that you need a $2,000 scale to measure. It's just twice as potent. And if you're going to inject it or snort it, take less because of the bioavailability differences. So this LD50 was done on mice and it's with IV. So the dose is going to be much lower. So the LD50 for IV heroin in mice is 21.797 milligrams per kilogram. When converting doses from mice, there's a different conversion factor, and the conversion factor is to divide the dose by 12.3 or multiply it by 0 .081. This will put the LD50 for humans at 1.77 milligrams per kilogram. While that may seem very low compared to the morphine LD50, you have to remember that IV doses make the drugs far more bioavailable, so far less is needed to cause desired effects. A heavy dose of IV heroin is 15 milligrams to like 30 milligrams. Chronic users will grow a tolerance and will likely be taking more than that, but as their tolerance grows, so will their LD50. That is also something I pointed out when I was talking about George Floyd and the Fox News articles about fentanyl, where they were saying two milligrams of fentanyl is lethal. And that's just kind of bullshit. That's a really horrible way of measuring lethal doses that leads to just fear-mongering and more fear being spread and shit like that. Now, it is important to say that tolerance can sort of lead to an increased risk of overdose in some ways. For example, people can overestimate their tolerance and take much more than they usually do and end up dying. That has and will continue to happen. But that typically only happens with addicts. And as I pointed out in the last episode, addicts are pretty statistically rare. They're, it's unlikely to become addicted to drugs. The vast majority of people don't. So for a 150-pound person... An average 150 pound person to die from IV heroin, it would take 122.4 milligrams. No responsible user should ever get anywhere near that dose, just like with morphine. Now, the reason there's no oral LD50 for heroin is because of the me metabolic process that turns heroin into morphine. It would be a pointless endeavor to try to measure that. So, with heavy doses of IV being between or not heavy, just doses for IV heroin being between 1 and like 30 milligrams and snorted heroin but being between like 5 and 50 milligrams, you can see why 122 milligrams is absurd for IV. And if, if this was a snorted LD50, which it, it's really hard to talk a rat into snorting certain amounts of a drug so we never really get snorted LD50s, but the snorted LD50 would be higher than the IV because the bioavailability is slightly lower. And the duration for heroin is three to six hours, depending on tolerance. So there isn't much of a need to redose this substance very often. If someone is addicted to drug, addicted to the drug, then they will likely be taking multiple doses throughout the day, as as all addicts do. Um, but for most people, they don't have time to be high all day, and that includes responsible people who enjoy heroin, just like they don't have time to be drunk all day. And they have a drink at the end of the day, they can have a little bump of heroin at the end of the day. So most drug users that use heroin will never reach this type of dose when they are injecting the drug. Again, we know that's true just looking at the amount of deaths caused by only heroin. It is very, very low. Uh, less than 20,000 people die a year to using heroin only. And not many people use heroin compared to opioid prescriptions. Because like I said, we have hundreds of millions of people using prescription opioids and less than 1% of them are dying. 14,000, um, I've never really seen a concrete statistic on how many heroin users are in the U.S., but if we just look at heroin deaths and we assume around a million people use it, then still it is unlikely to die from using heroin if it is clean and pure. Now before I move on to fentanyl, I want to mention something. I've been asked many times why I care about heroin being legalized, and on the surface this question kind of makes sense a little bit, but if someone were to watch all the episodes of the podcast so far, it should be pretty obvious why. And it's because more people are, are dying than should be dying. People are going to prison because they enjoy using heroin. And there's this like constant hypocrisy with drug use. Like Most people who ask me this question use a drug of some sort, whether it's caffeine or alcohol or nicotine or what it, whatever their drug of choice may be. They, they're not facing the same risks that heroin users are and that should change the, the there shouldn't be room for that type of blatant hypocrisy where 
It's like, oh, I can be able to use the drug of choice that I like and not face the risk of death due to contamination or face the risk of going to prison. But other people who like using drugs that I don't care about and don't like, they should face all those risks. So that that's why I I talk about these more controversial drugs like heroin and fentanyl. And later I'll talk about meth and PCP and drugs like that. Um, it's mainly just to try to keep people who use these drugs safe and just to allow people to make choices of what they want to do. Like I said in the first episode, in the Declaration of Independence, we were promised the pursuit of happiness to be an inalienable right. And if people consider heroin to be a tool in their pursuit of happiness, they should not be able to have that taken away. And then when you start banning stuff, you face other risks than just taking freedom away, like I pointed out in the first and second episode. And this is true of everything. When you ban abortion, abortions don't stop. People just do them unsafely. When you ban guns, gun sales don't stop. They're just in the hands of certain people or they're poorly made guns that cause other problems. So anytime people start moving towards a like prohibitive mindset where they think they need to start prohibiting things, uh, that should be a, a red flag for many reasons because it's only going to make that activity more dangerous. And unless you have very good evidence or reason to believe that prohibiting it would cause that activity to cease, then, prohib then prohibition is likely not the best move. So now we can move on to fentanyl, which is the new boogeyman on the streets. And fentanyl is not the problem, as I pointed out in the first episode. People tend to enjoy using fentanyl these days. Um, at first, I think it was just they were buying what they could find, and fentanyl became very available. But people ended up liking the substance, and many people seek it now. And I think part of that may be because it doesn't last very long, so it's not something that will take up your entire night. It, fentanyl usually only lasts 30 minutes to an hour, so it's not like something like heroin that can last six hours or LSD that can last eight or 12. It's a, it's a pretty manageable drug if it is taken in proper dosages. And the proper dosages and contamination are really the issues that people attribute to fentanyl. Those are the actual causes of it. It's, it's not the drug itself, obviously. The, the drug itself is inanimate. It is incapable of causing issues. Now, fentanyl is not an opiate where heroin and morphine are. Fentanyl is an opioid. And an o the definition of an opioid is anything that has affinity with opioid receptors. So uh, Narcan is an opioid. It's just an opioid antagonist. And uh, fentanyl is an opioid that produces morphine-like effects. And in, in some ways, you could consider a drug like alcohol an opioid because it uh, modulates the opioid system. So it does have affinity with those receptors in some way. It's like an atypical opioid, and it, it probably isn't worth considering an opioid because it's certainly a gabinergic drug which we'll talk about later um and we talked about it a little bit in the last episode and how the mechanism of alcohol can lead to death through withdrawal but it is interesting how it modulates the opioid system but for the most part i would like to keep the definition of opioid a little more constrained than that and just kind of identify it as drugs that have the, the, where the main mechanism of action for a drug is through activating opioid receptors or blocking them. That's usually what I'll define an opioid as. Now, uh, fentanyl is an FDA-approved medication. It is prescribed to people, particularly uh, with severe long-lasting cancer pains. Uh, people will be prescribed a, a patch of fentanyl where the fentanyl will be absorbed through the skin. Um now, there is a common myth going around that, and it has also led to just this furthering, like, boogeyman-type mentality towards fentanyl, and it's the idea that touching powdered fentanyl can kill you because they claim it is skin-active and that first responders can die from touching it, and that is just fucking bullshit. That's not true at all. Fentanyl has to be combined with other substances on the patch that allow it to be absorbed through the skin. Now... A little bit may get through your skin, but many, many studies from universities, from pharmacologists have repeatedly shown that it will never penetrate the skin effectively enough to kill someone from merely touching or holding the drug. This type of bullshit being spread about drugs is what landed us in this position in the first place. And something I talked about in the second episode is this sort of idea that fentanyl will always kill you 
and that's also just not true. And like we like I said in the George Floyd episode, where it's like they found fentanyl in his blood, so people were trying to say that oh, it was fentanyl that killed him, not the cop. And that's just that fentanyl equals death myth. Um, fentanyl has been used for 50 years in the medical community, and there's not a high rate of death through medically prescribed fentanyl, which again is another good model for legalization. Now, there have been some accidents where like a baby grabbed a fentanyl patch. That's that's on the parents. I don't understand how that happens. Um, and babies have died from that. But in terms of adults dying from ingesting the drug that was given to them by their doctor, the, the rate of that is extremely low with fentanyl, just like with most other drugs, including benzodiazepines and amphetamines and things like that. So really what I'm trying to say is that fentanyl is not a bad drug. There's no such thing as a bad drug. So when you see these news stories about fentanyl, you should try to keep in mind what the drug is. And just like the last two drugs, the main mechanism of action for the effects that fentanyl cause is the agonization of the mu opioid receptor. It partially agonizes the delta and kappa opioid receptor, but again, unless those are being fully activated consistently, then they're not going to have a huge effect on the experience. So the same thing that causes the high from heroin and the high from morphine and the high from fentanyl, it's across the board with these drugs. These drugs do the same thing to your brain. Now fentanyl is fully synthetic, so the molecule looks a lot different than heroin and morphine, as you see here. It doesn't look similar in any way but it still causes the same effects in the brain. The half-life is just much shorter, and it is much, much more potent, which is what has led to all of the deaths regarding fentanyl. Its potency and how often it is found combined with other opioids and other drugs that are dangerous to combine it with. There is another issue with a drug like fentanyl that I don't know if I mentioned in the first episode or not, and that is the variability of the purity of the substance found on the street. So if someone were to go buy a pill of fentanyl and it was sold to him as like a milligram of fentanyl and it's only 40% pure, he's taking 0.4 milligrams. And then the bioavailability will, uh, like if he eats it, the bioavailability is going to be a little bit lower. So he won't get as much of the drug as he thought he was. So next time he goes back and he buys two pills and these are 80% pure. Instead of taking double like he thought he was, he's really taking four times as much. And that can obviously lead to a deadly situation when you have a drug as potent as fentanyl. So pro uh, prohibition causes this issue as well. If we were to legalize these drugs and sell them like we do in pharmacies, it would have labeled purity. It would have the labeled dose. So you know exactly how much you're taking every time. And if you don't know how much you're taking of a drug as potent as fentanyl, even if it's the only drug in the product, which is highly unlikely when purchased on the street, it can still be deadly because of the purity variability. So all of these deaths that you see from fentanyl are a direct result of prohibition. It has nothing to do with the drug itself. It never does. And just to drive this home a little more, Let's talk about the LD50 of fentanyl. Now keep heroin and morphine in mind when we talk about this. Because in the first episode, I showed the results for drugs sold as heroin or drugs that contained heroin from that lab in California called Drugs Data. None of them were pure. All of them contained fentanyl. The IV LD50 for fentanyl is 2.9 milligrams per kilogram. Orally, it is 18 milligrams per kilogram. After the conversion is done, the human LD50s rest at 0.47 milligrams per kilogram and 2.9 milligrams per kilogram, respectively, compared to heroin's LD50 by IV sitting at 1.8 milligrams. It is incredibly obvious why this can be an extremely dangerous situation. An average 150 pound male only has to take 31 milligrams of fentanyl to reach average lethal doses. I said earlier a heavy dose of heroin is 15 to 30 milligrams. People with a tolerance will be taking more than that, and when these substances are combined, the LD50 for both drops. It will drop even more when it is combined with other drugs like antihistamines and shit we were seeing in the results of that lab taking drugs off the street and analyzing them. So, 
when you have this hyperpotent drug being mixed in with the drug supply of other drugs, you're obviously going to see people dying. And if we take that problem away by allowing fentanyl to be sold in a regulated environment with quality control, recommended dosages, known purity, then the safety of using this drug will skyrocket. Where with prohibition, it goes the opposite direction because you never know how much you're taking, you never know what's in the actual product, and you're combining multiple substances that shouldn't be combined. And you're just lowering that average lethal dose. So if a heroin user has been getting lucky and finding only heroin and they're taking 30 milligrams at a time, it takes one bad batch to kill that person. And they will likely die unless they have Narcan or someone near them. That problem goes away if these drugs are legalized. They all do the same thing to the brain. There is no mechanism for heroin to be more dangerous or addictive or anything like that than morphine. There's no mechanism for fentanyl to be more addictive or dangerous than heroin. It is all the same shit. Now, if you want to say the hyperpotency of fentanyl makes it more dangerous, I, I mean, I guess, kind of, but only in prohibition. Because people are prescribed fentanyl all the time, and they are fine. So if a drug is more potent than another drug, just take less of the potent drug. And when that is being sold to you in a regulated environment, you know what the doses are. If you get a bottle that says 200 micrograms of fentanyl, and it's 90% pure, you know exactly how much you're taking. It's not a mystery. It's not like, oh man, this could be heroin, or it could be fentanyl, or it could be both. I don't know how much to take because I want to enjoy this opioid, but I don't want to die. That goes away. And using these drugs immediately becomes safe. It becomes safer than alcohol. It becomes safer than tobacco. The only reason it's more risky and dangerous now is because they are illegal. There is nothing about the pharmacological properties of these drugs that makes them especially dangerous or addictive. And that's something I was trying to point out when I was going over what these drugs do to the brain. Now again, if you were to read a pharmacology textbook that spends 400 pages on one of these drugs, there's going to be added layers of complexity. But for the most part, heroin and morphine are more similar than they are different. Your brain can't tell the difference between them. There may be some sort of signaling bias that goes into heroin maybe causing a more intense effect or morphine lasting a little longer or whatever it may be. But for the most part, the main mechanism for these drugs is agonizing the mu opioid receptor, which causes very predictable effects. And those effects are predictable across all opioids, except for the more obscure ones like MPTP, which I talked about in the first episode. But even when we go to drugs like mitrogenine, which is my favorite drug, I take it every day. I'm on it right now. It is a partial and full agonist of the mu opioid receptor. And the reason it does both, both, sorry, is because the main drug, mitrogenine, is a partial agonist. But some of that drug is metabolized into an active metabolite called 7-hydroxy mitrogenine, and that is a full agonist. So when you take this drug, you get a little bit of a full opioid high, but for the most part, you're dealing with something similar to like buprenorphine, which is a drug people use to treat heroin withdrawal. So the point of this episode was just to show that this idea of an opioid epidemic is a myth and there's no reason to call it an opioid epidemic and not say we're in an alcohol or tobacco epidemic. And I also wanted to point out that the prescription opioid model that people talk shit about is really the best model for getting these drugs to the public because it keeps them safer. And only 8 to 12% of people using opioids, as I pointed out in the last chapter in great detail, that, that they're the only ones that become addicted to it. It's just a small minority of people. And you just see this direct correlation between a clean supply of drugs and less people dying. You see it with alcohol, too. As I said in the first episode, the, during alcohol prohibition, people were being blinded and maimed due to improperly made alcohol. And that would happen again if we prohibited alcohol again. So that pretty much wraps it up for this episode. When you're reading these stories online or hearing news stories about fentanyl and heroin and morphine, you or just opioids in general, I hope you keep in mind what was said in this episode. Um, because they frame some opioids to be the boogeyman, and they frame other ones to be useful medicinally, and they frame pharmaceutical companies who sell these opioids as boogeymen themselves, when it's all just like fear-mongering, just bullshit. Like, the minority of people 
face severe side effects from opioids. The, these drugs, particularly when administered medicinally, they have helped way more people than they've hurt. So even though Purdue Pharma's getting sued, I mean, I guess you could say they were a little irresponsible with the marketing of their drugs, making claims that it isn't addictive and stuff, and suing them for stuff like that is fine. But for the most part, it's just important to remember that toxicologically, these drugs are much safer than drugs like tobacco and alcohol. The reason they kill so many people a year, or the reason they find their way to so many people dying per year, is solely because of prohibition. And if we really want to fix these problems, uh, like politicians and doctors and everybody claims they want to do, uh, we need to focus on getting rid of prohibition, uh, not suing Chinese labs for creating fentanyl, because that is stupid. We need to look at what the actual issues are, and the issue is not a Chinese lab creating a substance. The issue is that people don't know what they're taking, they don't know how pure it is. We can fix that issue easily by just legalizing these drugs. And that is what needs to be done if, like I said, if we really want to fix this stuff. So that'll wrap it up for the opioids podcast. Um, this is kind of a intro as to what the second half of the book is, or second part. It's much more than the second half. But it's basically just going over the mechanisms of these drugs, how they can kill you, um, what causes the effects, dosages, dosages, safe dosages, lethal dosages, everything like that. So the, what I want the these podcast episodes to serve for in the second part of the book is not only to educate people on what drugs are, but also to educate drug users on how to use them safely. And the next episode is going to be a lot shorter. It's just going to be how to use a new drug safely. And I imagine that's going to be one of the more uh, controversial parts of my book. Of course, I'm not telling anyone to go use drugs. It's just for people who already do and who are interested in trying new drugs. And since we live in a culture of prohibition, there are certain steps that have to be taken unnecessarily to make uh, drug use as safe as possible. And that's what the next episode is going to cover. So I will see you next time. Thanks for sticking around. And of course, follow me on Twitter at the drug book MP. And I'll have another episode out this week. Thank you.